Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dude Nurse Show. How's everybody been? Well, I hope. Hope you're well into your New Year's resolutions, whatever they may be. I've got a few of my own um, that I'm working on, and, you know, they seem to be the same damn ones every single year. I know I know some of y'all out there can relate to me. Anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about today. Today, I want to talk about putting the care back in health care. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of goofy, but stick with me. Have you ever been to the doctor, um, maybe had somebody come into your home for home health or some sort of interaction with a health care professional, and maybe you felt like they weren't really paying attention um, because they seemed more focused on doing paperwork or maybe they have a tablet of some sort, some computer screen that they're just kind of, you know, click, 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 click. Hang on, I could do some sound effects. Uh-huh. Yep. Okay. All right. Yep. Still taking that? Does that sound about right? If, if, if you've experienced that, you're certainly not alone. I too have experienced that uh, as a healthcare professional. I've seen coworkers do it, and I'll be honest, sometimes I've done it myself. I'm not going to lie. Um, I'll be the first to call out my own BS. Um, and I've also experienced it as a patient or a consumer or a customer or a client or whatever the hell fancy term they want to use nowadays. And it's really, it's really shitty, in my opinion. You know, you're paying all this money and you, even, even if there's not some major concern, you know, God forbid you're discussing cancer or, you know, some lump on your kidney or on your breast, you know, you really want to feel like whoever you're talking to, A, is paying attention and B, you'd kind of like them to give a shit. You know, I know, I know I do. And so what I see is that as, as healthcare providers and professionals, we spend so much freaking time dealing with paperwork. And when I say paperwork, for all intents and purposes, we're talking about electronic medical systems, um, or I'm sorry, electronic medical records, EMRs, as they're called in the biz. Um, funny, funny thing about that, the thought process was to make things kind of more secure, um, easier for people to access, all those kinds of things. And they were going to cut down on paper, right? You got everything in this computer and we don't need to print all this stuff. Horseshit. We actually use, in a lot of cases, just as much or more paper than we did before we became quote unquote electronic. It's really stupid. I don't get it. But we're not gonna dive down that that rabbit hole. We're gonna take we're gonna take the blue pill instead of the red pill. There's a matrix reference for you. Um, so what is what is the deal with that? What is the deal with people being so enamored with the the charting aspect of it? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, some people are just straight up task oriented. You know we have a task and we're going to do it and everything else going on around us doesn't really matter. In a lot of ways, that's kind of good for a medical professional because, you know, not not being able to get distracted easily, you know, we'd be less prone to mistakes. There's a lot of stuff going on, people always interrupting us, other patients needing things, coworkers, phones ringing, doctors, you get where I'm going with this. So, that's one way of looking at it. But the real answer is, if we don't fill out 75,000 pages, we're not going to get paid. We're not going to get reimbursed. And this is, this is an insurance issue, okay? Insurance companies have... Well, let me back up. I am 100% for checks and balances. I think it keeps us all on our toes. It helps prevent, or, or it, it strives to help prevent waste, um, errors, those kinds of things. But yet, at the some sometimes you can have 
parameters that are either too strict or not not strict enough. I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say, for example, there's there's concepts in like what's called uh, lean principles and Six Sigma um, that talk about increasing efficiency, waste reduction, those kinds of things. So let's say I'm making, I don't know, pencils, okay, at my factory, and I institute guidelines that say we will reject every single pencil that is not one one thousandth of a millimeter in diameter at the the point of the lead okay that's pretty damn small so for example if we have one that's you know one one hundredth of a millimeter that pencil's going to get rejected you wouldn't even be able to tell at the naked eye so that's pretty strict okay the other side of that is if you have parameters that are that'll just let anything through pretty soon you'd have pencils coming through that were the size of baseball bats right you know so there's too much and too little of any of anything and and where i think we're going with this healthcare where we have these just brutal restrictions on things um, I, I think we're kind of doing certainly our patients a, a, a disservice, but it's, it's extremely frustrating. It creates a lot of red tape, a lot of BS for for the providers, you know, because I mean, at the end of the day, I don't know about you, but I go to work to make money to be able to pay my bills, um, you know, go on vacation, take care of my family, yada, yada, yada. So everybody's no different, you know, so we all go to work to make money. But, you know, we're not really allowed to say that in healthcare. Everything's about the patients. Well, yeah, it is, but I go to work to make money, okay? I love what I do, but I go to work to make money. So when we go in and we have all these restrictions and all these, all this red tape and all this crap that, that we have to deal with, think about this. When, when, when you're sitting in there um, and you're talking to your, your healthcare provider, your nurse, whatever, they may come in and spend what? 10, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes tops with you, I guarantee you they're spending at least that much time and probably a hell of a lot more doing the paperwork. So in essence, we end up spending more time doing paperwork than we do with our patients. That is crazy. You know, you can only say and do so much in these in these limited in this limited amount of time. You know, you can't save the charting for the end of the day. You're, you're not supposed to. There's parameters, um, for example, in home health and hospice and um, even in, in hospitals. You can't, you know, just say, oh, you know, I didn't get to it today in my shift. I'll come back tomorrow. I'm off. I'll clock in and do it. No, it, it doesn't work that way. Your stuff has to be finished by the time you get off. You're handing care over to the next person. So same thing, like I said, in home health and hospice, you have to have, let's say you go to admit a patient uh, on hospice and they're at their home and you go in there and you do this full admission and you leave because you just got to get home and you say, oh, I'll do it later. You don't have that much time to complete that paperwork. And the paperwork in and of itself is not so much the problem. It's the amount of redundancy that we see I think anybody out there could certainly understand that the mortal enemy of efficiency is redundancy. Well, what do I mean by redundancy in healthcare? Well, for example, if you look at a chart, say a newly admitted patient, you have to put their vital signs in like 12 different places. You know, you have to sign your name, whether whether it's electronic or uh, physical signature. You have to sign in multiple places. It's one record. Why do you have to sign your name 17 times within a patient's record? Everything is time stamped and date stamped, and it knows you know whose login was there, so it knows. Okay, you know this is Greg R N. He saw this patient, and he submitted this at this time. Okay, perfect, great. And if somebody else came in right behind me and did an assessment or whatever, then it would stamp them and so on and so forth. So we have all of this redundancy going on. You know, same thing when patients are filling out consent forms and all, you know, all of all of these all of these different things. And I'm not saying that we should not still do our job do our jobs and do our due diligence and explain things 
to our patient. I'm saying that we can, I think we can streamline a lot of this stuff and make it considerably more efficient and we can spend more. So if we have an hour and we spend 15 minutes with a patient and 45 minutes documenting that to me, that's a problem, you know, and especially when you look at patient outcomes and, and things of that nature, you know, we're cramming a lot of stuff in that 15 minutes. So how much does that patient really understand with, with 15 minutes, you know, the, and we're, we're billing for an hour because we're doing all this other kind of stuff and yada, yada, yada. But the point I'm trying to make is that I think we can do a much better job, you know, and, and patients, I know, get frustrated because sometimes they don't feel like they're being listened to. You know, there's these um, patient uh, scores and indicators and all of these things that we look at on what we call like a national level or we are graded again. Like one hospital reports its data and then another hospital reports its data. We look at what we call a benchmark. There's national benchmarks. So you see, you know, how well your facility, your hospital, your home health, your hospice, your nursing home, whatever the case may be, how well you compare to the national average. And and those kinds of things, pay, there's patient satisfaction surveys that get sent out. Um, healthcare providers are heavily reimbursed on the outcomes of, of, of said survey. So the point I'm trying to make is I feel like a lot of the stuff that we're doing sometimes is just more geared towards trying to get good scores on a survey, not so much providing good care because you would think that, hey, if I provide good care to this patient, then my scores are going to be good. But unfortunately, it, it doesn't always work that way. It doesn't, it doesn't correlate directly. And there's some, there's some other reasons why, but you know, we're not going to go too deep into that. But as I said, unfortunately, it, it doesn't correlate that linearly. It's, it's much more complicated. And so I think that we have taken the care out of healthcare. I really and truly do. We look at, you know, people on the, on the floor. I never worked as a floor nurse, quote unquote floor nurse. I was an ER nurse. So floor nurses, when I would call up to give report on a patient from my ER that's being admitted, the floor, they would be like, oh my God, I'm getting an A word. And that A word is admission. I know what you were thinking I meant. You thought I meant asshole. Sometimes they got those too. Sometimes I was happy to get that patient the hell out of my ER. But I'm talking about an admission, an admit. Nurses hate that word. Hate it, hate it, hate it. Mainly because, and in, in my dealing with some of the nurses, like when I was a house supervisor, I would go around the different units and check on people and all this other kind of stuff. The nurses, they, because there's so much paperwork to do, there's so much stuff to fill out, there's so many boxes to check. And like I said before, you're checking, I swear, you're checking the same box several times in multiple places. I mean, it's it's a little it's a little ridiculous. And 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 I know that you know, this is a very litigious society. Everybody likes to sue everybody. But goddamn people, health care. It's not health don't care. That's that's what it's that's what it's becoming. Health don't care. You know, and I like I said, I think we can do a much better job. We don't have to be quite so task oriented and we can do our jobs so much better. The other thing that they that they try to do too is they will load the hell out of the staff for the ratios. For example, there's some units on the hospital where one nurse is responsible for seven, eight, nine patients I've seen. And this is not a critical care floor. It may be like a medical surgical floor. Patients are pretty stable. But at the, at the same time, though, one of the things I've noticed, like if you look at ERs, ORs, uh, ICU, um, you know, your, your very critical care areas, there's a lot of research out there that talks about, you know, nurse to patient ratio. However, there's not a lot of research out there that talks about nurse to patient ratio in these, what we call like step down units where the acuity is much lower. 
what I think goes on, and I've seen it happen, the nurse is so busy, maybe maybe they have a tech, maybe they don't, or a, you know, a nurse's aide or whatever, um, d- different hospitals call them different things, but it's basically someone to, to help out the nurse. Maybe they have one, maybe they don't. So a lot of the things that, you know, they would be getting help with, like, you know, running water to a patient or, you know, just little tasks that really anyone could do. And the nurse should be left to do more specialized things, giving meds, doing assessments, talking to doctors, all those kinds of things, right? We're supposed to have this team environment. That that doesn't always happen. So so as a result, patients, a patient may start to have a decline. It may not be a precipitous decline. So it, it's very subtle. They may have from shift change to shift change or, you know, from, you know, usually the vital signs are done every four hours on a stable floor like that. So maybe at 8 a.m. their blood pressure was this and maybe now at noon their blood pressure is that or their heart rate or their respiratory rate or maybe they have a slight temp. So because they're so busy, they're going to miss things like that. You know, it can be subtle. And like I said, if you're swamped, you, you are going to miss that. And then guess what? That patient is going to end up with a longer length of stay in the hospital. He or she may also end up on a higher acuity floor. They may have to be moved up to the ICU because they now have this infection and it's got to be treated. And oh, guess what? They're going to be in the hospital for another two weeks. That doesn't tie so much into the paperwork, but it's it's the same kind of concept because they're just trying to, the, it, these insurance companies, and it's a lot of it's CMS, Center for Medicare, Medicaid Services, regardless of what type of insurance you have, by and large, Medicare is basically daddy, okay? Medicare says what goes. So these insurance companies say, you know, hey, we're only going to pay you so much for this diagnosis. This patient came in here to have knee surgery. This is the money you're going to get. That's it. If that patient's knee gets infected, tough shit. Guess what? You just paid for it. Those things are preventable. I'm not saying that they're not. But the overall message is that I just think that they're just trying to have us do too much with too little resources. You know, I think if we could spend more time with patients, less time on the computer with our heads in the chart, I think our outcomes would be better. And eventually it could kind of help stabilize this crazy out of control thing that we have here in the United States called healthcare. And as I said, another way of doing that is, you know, you can't overload your staff. You know, you just, you just can't do it. I mean, these are people's lives. It's not like we work at McDonald's and, you know, oh my goodness, I've got, you know, 17 Big Macs to cook. Well, if someone's Big Mac is burnt, undercooked, doesn't taste good, so what? They get a new Big Mac, right? You give them their money back, give them a discount next time they order, everything's gravy. But we're talking about people's lives. If you screw up and miss something subtly that you should have caught, there may not be a refund. There may not be a do-over, you know? And that's that's kind of scary. So I just wanted to kind of mention that to point that out to some of y'all, see what y'all's thoughts are. If you've had any experiences like that where you just, you know, hear the person's head in the computer and they just, uh-huh, uh-huh, yep, uh-huh, uh-huh, you know, um, it's interesting and it's, it's kind of scary uh, in my opinion. But we'll see what y'all think. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of the Dude Nurse Show. Until next time, take it easy.